Hello and welcome to a baggage claim Q&A about Harry and Meghan. So let's get started. Question one, can you talk about Meghan Markle's disrespect for British royal protocol? Meghan's treatment of royal protocol definitely bothers a lot of people. Meghan has repeatedly brought up the fact that she didn't know how to curtsy and was surprised that she would need to curtsy to the queen even in private. And her description of that moment is partly to highlight how unprepared she was for her role in the family. But mostly it feels like it's meant to disrespect the protocol by kind of drawing attention to how ridiculous it is to her. That in this day and age, something that seems like out of medieval times dinner and tournament is just so silly, right? But what is the purpose of that curtsy? It's a recognition of the queen and the position that she embodies symbolically for an entire culture. And protocols or, you know, rules serve a lot of purposes for a culture, like establishing norms, helping communication, and building trust between people. We Americans have our norms. We like firm handshakes and people who can maintain appropriate eye contact. We like a good amount of small talk and humor in our conversations, and we culturally respect honesty, optimism, and reciprocity. But of course, we are very, and I mean very, casual, which is very different from the Brits. But Meghan has no respect for British norms. She finds it strange that William and Catherine are so formal and don't want to be hugged right when they first meet her. Meanwhile, she's greeting them for the first time in ripped jeans and barefooted. But then she wonders why the people of the UK and the royal family aren't happy with her. Now, I'm not arguing that she should have to change, and that's her argument too. Her whole point is that I'm me, I am authentic, I shouldn't have to pretend. But I think this is a very flawed way to look at things. If you're marrying into a family, royal or not, it is important to learn about their culture. If you're from the same culture, then that's easy. But like in the situation with my husband and me, he had a lot to learn about the Indian culture. He doesn't have to adopt all of it, but if he treats it with derision or mockery, that's not really going to help his relationship with my family. And in Meghan's case, while she was a working royal, she flouted the protocols consistently. And of course, her argument was, I didn't know, no one told me, which is just not true. It's more obvious that she didn't want to. She didn't want to show the British people, nor the royal family, that she was willing to get to know their culture and learn their rules. There's this wonderful quote by Picasso, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. And we all know this on an unconscious level, that when it comes to rules that we live by, we don't like it when people break them without first learning, understanding, and acknowledging the purpose of the rules. And this honestly, in my opinion, is why Catherine Middleton doesn't get criticized when she breaks royal protocol. It's not because she and William have this chokehold over the press, like Harry and Meghan think. I think the press reflects what the public believes. And I think Catherine, over the last 20 years, has shown the British people and her family that she respects the institution that she has married into and intends to live up to the ideals it embodies. So when she breaks a rule here and there, people don't really mind. Whereas Meghan has never done that. She was a working royal for two years and has only ever treated the institution and the British culture with derision and disrespect. Do you think the recent Netflix documentary changes anything, specifically the narrative? Do Harry and Meghan think they're coming out stronger, more likable after the past few weeks? I think Harry and Meghan are genuinely shocked that they have not been received well. The documentary has caused a massive drop in their popularity, even in America. I would say before, most people were either ambivalent to them or just simply respected their right to leave and lead private lives. But now more and more people are calling out their inconsistencies and their nonsense narratives. The people who supported them will continue to do so and I'll address why separately. But the people who didn't care or just didn't have enough information are now starting to see the truth. And so many people have come out on Twitter and TikTok talking about the inconsistencies of their stories and how they generally seem disingenuous. This is what happens with a narcissist. The more you're exposed to one, the more you can see through the image that they're trying to paint. This is why a narcissist typically has to move every few years, not necessarily physically, but it has to change jobs, social circles, etc. because they start to get found out. And that's exactly what's happening here. Do Harry and Meghan actually want privacy? This is definitely one of the most common questions. Why are Harry and Meghan always asking for privacy, but constantly infringing on their own, as well as their families? They are in this massive war against the British press in wanting space. But in his book, Harry is talking about his privates, intimate details about his sexual encounters, as well as information about his children. It's because they don't want privacy. They want control. They want to be perceived a certain way and impose their will 
either by force, which is way too obvious, or by creating an intense victim narrative, where then other people who feel sorry for them will attack their enemies and force them to fall in line, which is what they want. Control. Less obvious, very manipulative. The privacy thing has always been a lie. They want to be in the media, but they want to control what the media says about them, and they want to be paid for any information they give out. When will Harry and Meghan go away, and will their fans ever move on? Do narcissists ever give up, or will they complain ad infinitum? I don't think they will go away. Maybe if and when they break up, Harry might have his path of rehabilitation, but who knows. But Meghan will never stop, because it is fundamentally unacceptable to her that she isn't as widely revered as she thinks she should be. Narcissists never give up. They just keep changing their stories to see what will hopefully stick. The public will definitely grow tired of them and eventually stop reporting on the pair completely. But for now, they will continue to hold attention because they represent such an intense challenge to the national identity of the United Kingdom as well as the US in a lot of ways, and I'll discuss that in more detail separately. As long as our culture allows for victim narratives to be used in public discussion, they will continue. Right now, victim narratives reign supreme, so they're riding that wave as hard as possible to grow their influence and make money. What were Harry and Meghan trying to accomplish with the Netflix documentary? Their motivations are quite simple. Harry and Meghan are incredibly unhappy with their reputations. So, as far as I could tell, here were the four goals they were trying to accomplish with their documentary. Number one, establish that Meghan was trepidatious going into this relationship. As we've gotten to know Meghan more and more, many people, including myself, have wondered if this entire relationship and their exit from the royal family was by her design, since she has shown clear indications of being a social climber. We've seen that she she really enjoys the attention, the title, and wanted to isolate Harry from his family and friends. But this is the narrative that she and Harry tried very hard to rebut, claiming that she was so happy before she met Harry and loved her life and really didn't want, nor was she prepared for all this attention. Their second goal was to show that the world just how incredible their love story is. They really do believe that their love is the greatest story we've ever witnessed. A lot of the content is around that and how much they love each other and the overarching message is love wins and love won. This is very consistent with the narcissist approach because it's a very us versus them mentality. Often a narcissist will stir up the idea of this paranoia in their relationship, claiming that other people don't want them to be together because of jealousy. But seeing their love up close, people wonder if it is an act because it all feels disingenuous. People often point out online examples of those couples that overshare, that overemphasize how happy they are, but typically tend to be the least happy. And all of Harry and Meghan's display of love in the documentary just felt overly manufactured, especially those moments where one of them is crying, usually Meghan. If you see that your wife is crying, the fact that you could even take a phone out to take a photo is just astounding. I know I would be very upset if my husband did that instead of trying to comfort me. Honey, I know you're crying, but could you just hold that pose so I can document this for a documentary that we don't even know we're going to make, supposedly? Very manufactured. Normal people don't think like that, and it's not a healthy way way to think. The third goal was to show that Harry and Meghan are victims of a pushy press. So much of the documentary talks about the perils of the press and they try so hard to draw comparisons between what Diana endured and what they're going through. They had to rely on photoshopping press intrusion or using pictures from the Harry Potter premiere because they just couldn't prove that they were being hounded because they're not and they weren't. The press treatment of the royals has really changed since Princess Diana's days and they don't want to acknowledge that because it breaks their victim narrative. Meghan wants to be followed by the press. She loves it. That's why she pays to be papped all the time. They complain about her father working with the press in that infamous shoot that he had set up, but she obviously does it all the time. And the final goal of the documentary was to show that Meghan could have been this incredible asset to the royal family, the United Kingdom, and really to the world. The documentary was so self-congratulatory. People talking about how amazing Meghan Markle is. She's so kind, so loving, so compassionate, so beautiful. And that all she ever wanted to do was serve the world. And she would have been the greatest asset for a racist institution and a racist family because she could have helped them evolve into the future. This point just really upset a lot of people of color because they saw through this nonsense. Meghan Markle has hidden the fact that she is mixed race and passed as white until it was an opportune time for her to be the supposedly oppressed woman of color. She uses her race and her black mother to really control the narrative and be looked at in a positive, victimized light. 
Why are there so many inconsistencies in Harry and Meghan's stories? Harry and Meghan keep saying that this is their time to share their side. But with the Oprah sit-down, Meghan's interview with The Cut, and her podcast, they have been sharing their side and their story for a while now. The problem is people are not buying it. Narcissists have a very loose relationship with the truth because they're always trying to look at situations in a way that favored them. So the details of any situation shift to suit their desire to be perceived a certain way. The more we the public are refusing to buy their story, the more it changes because it wasn't true in the first place. And they certainly can't keep track of the number of lies Harry and Meghan have been telling all this while. We saw that Meghan lied about the color of her dress for their first date. During the documentary, they never mentioned their supposed wedding three days prior, which Meghan had mentioned during the Oprah interview. Pretty much every story has some kind of hole in it because they're not telling us the truth. They are telling us what they think we need to hear from them in order to be on their side and be against the royal family. Can you talk about the gaslighting regarding the racism allegations that Harry and Meghan made against the royal family during the Oprah interview? But now, according to Harry, never happened. It was very strange that Harry has now started to deny the racism allegations since they've had two years to put out a statement clarifying after the Oprah interview. They of course accepted an award for fighting racism in the royal family. My guess about why he changed his position here is because their accusations haven't had the effect that he wanted. I think he wanted the family to be apologetic and publicly eat crow over this matter, but the queen handled it so masterfully saying that recollections may vary. That was a wonderful response because it made the point that modern woke definition of racism is down to perception rather than fact that a family member's curiosity in how adults with different skin color might make what type of baby could be interpreted as kind interest or hateful criticism. Harry and Meghan made the point that Archie wasn't given a title or security because of concerns over his skin color. But of course, those points were proven false since he was offered a title, but Harry and Meghan just didn't want it. And if they're not working royals, why would their child have security? It makes no sense since the public has to pay for that security and they have to serve the the public in order to earn the security. Very simple. I think another reason that he switched the accusation from racism to unconscious bias is because it's a lot harder to refute. Oh, it's unconscious, so how would they even know they're being racist? It's very sneaky. It's like when people are told that they've internalized misogyny or colonialism. It's a way to just downgrade someone as a brainwashed being and rob them of any ability to defend themselves. How can people still believe Harry and Meghan when they've been proven to be liars? People often perceive the truth not as a binary thing, but a subjective idea based on what they believe. And that's because even if two people accept the same thing as the truth, doesn't mean they'll interpret it in the same way. Let me explain. For a long time, people brought up the fact that Harry and Meghan should not have revealed that she was pregnant at Princess Eugenie's wedding. My perception of the truth was that Meghan Markle clearly and purposefully left a coat button undone, knowing that it would cause the media to wonder. There were also rumors floating around that the pair went to all the guests and told them about the pregnancy during the wedding. People who love Harry and Meghan could easily reject that saying, oh, the button doesn't mean anything and people just don't like them. That's why they're making up the rumor. Then Harry confirmed in his book that they did reveal the pregnancy at the wedding. And I saw an analysis on a news show where one woman found a way to justify it as, well, it's after the wedding, probably during the reception. Why shouldn't they share their joyous news with their families? At a wedding? Really? So that's an example of how one person could look at and justify anything they do, including lying, including making accusations of racism without providing any proof. And this is because it comes down to what people believe on a high level. If you are on the side of the truth, of honesty, of integrity, then anyone lying or making underhanded comments are a problem, regardless of why. But if you want Harry and Meghan to attack the monarchy because you think the monarchy should not exist, or you think the monarchy should be brought to heel for whatever reason, then you will find a way to give Harry and Meghan as much leniency as possible because ultimately they're accomplishing what you want, which is attacking the monarchy and trying to undermine their position in the British society. What causes the cognitive dissonance that makes Harry and Meghan think that people will fall for their lies? Example, fabricated paparazzi chase scene in the documentary. Harry and Meghan think they can get away with their lies because they know that there are people out there willing to buy into their victimized viewpoints simply because of their hatred of the monarchy or white people or really Western society. They know they can rally that crowd and they want to rally that crowd under Meghan Markle's banner to help advance her brand and influence. 
Does it make your argument stronger or weaker to admit that the other side's argument has merit? Regarding Courtier's and Valentine Lowe's balanced and mature approach versus Harry and Meghan's one-sided version. Why hasn't Harry specially caught on to the fact that so much valid criticism is being brought against them both? We know how Meghan thinks of the situation, but I'm more fascinated as to why Harry seemed so blind to it all, despite his own family and half of his country being staunchly against his current actions. I love that first question because I think we all know that a fair and balanced perspective is better, but often personally struggle to see a situation that way. Let me give you an example. The next time you're in a fight with your significant other, just pay attention to how you might be tempted to paint with those broad strokes when it comes to telling them how awful they are, right? You might say, you always do this or you never do that. And it's that absolute, no wiggle room perspective that really fuels an active fight. I know I do this a lot. And that's exactly what Harry is doing because he isn't a journalist and we know he's immature and this memoir the documentary and all the interviews are them publicly fighting with his family. And let's go over some examples of their very one-sided perspective. Throughout the documentary, the pair complain about how the press was overly critical of Meghan while being incredibly soft on Catherine, but fail to show all the times that the press have been hard on Catherine and incredibly soft on Meghan. In fact, even in the examples that they show about the press calling out Meghan for breaking royal protocol are not properly represented. The headline reads, Meghan Markle broke royal shoe protocol at Bondi Beach. But when you look up the full article, the first line reads, it looks like Meghan Markle's breaking the rules, but she's looking great while she's doing it. They also show the example of a Harper's Bazaar article that says, Meghan Markle broke royal protocol by wearing an off-the-shoulder dress to Trooping the Color 2018. But if you read the article, Here's what it had to say. Despite baring her shoulders at Trooping the Color, Meghan looked every bit as regal as her sister-in-law, Kate Middleton. But of course, the couple wouldn't want to point all this out because they want us to see them as victims. Now, when it comes to the pair's complaints against Harry's family, many people are heavily criticizing them for being so one-sided, since obviously the royal family really can't respond to all these claims. I think a good sign of maturity is when a person can see the nuance of any situation, as well as their own hand in the problems that they're involved in. It takes two to tango and realizing that you are half the problem in any situation really helps people have more productive relationships. Harry and Meghan obviously struggle with this considering how small their circle is and continues to grow smaller. I don't know if you all come across those posts on Instagram where people will say things like, as I grow older, I realize I can't take everyone's nonsense. I like that my circle is small. I'm doing a bad job of paraphrasing, but if you've come across one of those posts, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's this arrogant insistence that it's good that their circle is so small because because they're too real and too authentic for people. And that's how Harry and Meghan are. <laughs> They've broken with so many friends and most of their families, and the viewpoint they always take that it's the other person's fault, which is very narcissistic. So no, both Harry and Meghan will never be able to see their own hand in anything, nor hear any criticism and react to it in a mature way. And this is consistent with everything they've said in the interviews and the book. It's their inability to see both sides that's ultimately their undoing. People trust a balanced view a lot more. Because because it is closer to the truth. Why is there such a divide between those that dislike Harry and Meghan and those that like them? This is a wonderful question. Also, I often see comments from people wondering why this Meghan and Harry drama even matters. Why are people giving them so much attention? Why can't we just leave them alone? Fair questions, and the answer is simple. People would leave them alone if they stopped attacking the monarchy. The reason there is this massive divide is because it's actually a public argument over our society's values. And I'm lumping America into that as well, because even though we don't have a monarchy, monarchy, we have great close ties with the UK when it comes to our values. So for the values, it comes down to duty versus self. The monarchy represents service above all with, and this is important, dignity. While Harry and Meghan represent the self-esteem movement that says that the self comes above everything. And you might say, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't all of Western society built on the idea of individual freedom? Yes, it is. But the question is, what should that freedom be used for? Should an individual strive to do what's best for his community and society? Or or should he be able to bend the community to serve what he desires? And again, a healthy perspective should be somewhere in between, where the individual and the community constantly negotiate to figure out what is the best for both. And that's
that's what Prince William does so well, where he obviously sacrifices a lot for the sake of this role as the heir, but also draws boundaries, especially around his family, to help him maintain his sense of individual sovereignty. This is also why there's this discrepancy in what people on either side of this, Harry and Meghan issue, consider the truth. One side would say that the truth is something that the majority of the community can agree on as the truth. People on Harry and Meghan's side would say that the truth is very, would say that the truth is a very personal thing. It's their truth or her truth, not the truth. That's why people are okay with Harry misremembering things in his memoir, Spare, because it's a personal interpretation, and to them, that's okay. So this is not really a matter where we can all just agree to disagree, because Harry and Meghan are so critical of the royal family and want to fundamentally change their behavior and how we should look at them. And what creates true unity in a society is the ability to point at the same values and say, most of the time, we all agree with that. Typically, Western society values have been that the individual is free, every individual is equal, they have the freedom to speak, to think, and to practice the religion of their choice. But there are also implicit values values of the importance of the truth and duty. This is why when people speak lies, we find it so abhorrent and call them out on it. Same with duty. If we see that someone is being incredibly selfish, we call it out because we actually believe that a person shouldn't just exist for themselves. They should aim to help other people, whether it's their family, their friends, or their community. That's why this push for my truth versus the truth or this whole self-care movement needs to be openly criticized because it encourages mistruth and self-centeredness as being perfectly acceptable. Harry and Meghan accused the royal family of racism, but provided no proof. And their defenders will say, well, that proof doesn't matter because it's their lived experience and we just have to accept that at face value. Nope, we don't. We want the truth. And as for duty, Harry and Meghan really just pretend to care about their duties. During the documentary, they kept talking about their desire to serve the world and that they're both so aligned on these goals. But at every opportunity, when they are carrying out royal duties, they have complained about their commitment. During her podcast, Megan talks about the aftermath of the fire in the baby's nursery, which turned out to be just a smoking heater, and she feels that it's wrong to have to go and carry out their engagement. What do you think duty is? It is showing up even when it's inconvenient, because the people who you claim to care about have been waiting for hours for you to show up. They've done all the preparations to welcome you and host you, and wouldn't it be better for you to feel slightly inconvenienced rather than you disappoint all those people that have been waiting? So this is why there's such a connect because a Megan supporter would say, well, she comes first because having to fulfill your obligations are part of a toxic oppressive system. While a critic would say, it's more important to live up to your word. Thank you for watching everyone. This is just the first part of the Q&A. The second part will be posted next week. If you're watching this once it's already been posted, then I will link it in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And of course, I'll see you next time.